if we want to really understand this, we kind of have to go back a couple of chapters, and we're not going to we're not going to turn there, but just to recount the story. If you go back a few chapters, you read about a guy named Stephen. Stephen. He was one of the first deacons of the church because if you remember, if you, again, this is, this is history. If, uh, if you remember the, the, the story, the apostles, there were 11, 12 apostles because they picked somebody to replace Judas. And they, they got, what was happening is the, uh, there were, there were Hebrew believers and then there were, there were Jews from other parts of the world. They called them Grecians. And the Grecian Jews were complaining because their women weren't getting food. Okay. You may even have that back then. So, uh, so they appointed deacons because the apostles said, listen, we're busy uh, praying, studying the word and preaching God's word. And, uh, they said, we don't have time to wait on tables. So they appointed people called deacons. Deacons today in a lot of churches, deacons are like big shots. But back in those days, they, those were people that waited on tables. They were waiters, right? So they picked out, they picked seven deacons and one of them was named Stephen. And Stephen was, full of the Holy Spirit, and God used him in a mighty way. And Stephen began going out on the streets, talking to people, talking to Jews about Jesus. And, 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 they, and, and the Jewish hierarchy, the, the Sanhedrin, who were like the Jewish rulers, they didn't like the fact, they hated Jesus. They were responsible for causing the Romans to nail Jesus to a cross. And they thought once they nailed him to a cross, they'd be done with him. But they had more problem after he, after he was nailed to the cross and resurrected than they had when he was there, just one guy, you know. He, uh, he empowered all his people with the Holy Spirit to be able to go forth and share God's Word. So they got all these Christians out there now talking about Jesus. And there's this guy named Stephen. And they corralled him and they brought him before the court of the Sanhedrin. And he laid a, he laid a message on them. And he said, you stiff-necked and, and slow, of, slow to understand them. He called them all kinds of names because they, were, they rejected Christ. So they killed him. He was the first Christian martyr. You know, today we read about Christians getting their heads cut off and, and getting put to death. Well, Stephen was the first one. They stoned him to death. And when they stoned him to death, there was a young man there who was a member of the Sanhedrin, who was a, a ruler of the Jews, and he was, uh, his name was Saul. And it said that he, he stood at their, at their cloaks, like he was, he was like the, uh, the authority that said, stone him, right? So this guy named Saul, he hated Jesus. He was probably there when Jesus was, was uh, condemned to, uh, to, to be crucified. Uh, when, uh, when they had the, the court there for him, he was probably there. He's probably one of the ones that said, crucify him. And, and now he's got his followers running around telling everybody about Jesus. And, and they, he wanted to shut them up. So he was there when, when Stephen was stoned. And, uh, and now it, it says this in chapter 8. Now this is where we're going to jump in. Okay, so you got the picture, right? This is uh, ancient Israel. This is this Saul man. He's he's on fire. He thinks he's on fire for God, and he thinks that this bunch of Christians is nothing but a bunch of troublemakers because they're just stirring things up. So he wants to get rid of them. So it says in chapter eight of Acts, and starting at verse one, Saul was consenting unto his death, and at the time. There was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem, and they were scattered everywhere. Okay, so we read now, and in, 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 we're going to go to chapter 9. But I wanted you to see that Saul, he was stirring things up against believers. He was rounding them up. He wanted to wipe this mess out. Now in chapter 9, look at chapter 9, verse 1, just to get, just to get a picture. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples. Isn't that wonderful? Don't you love when somebody breathes out threatenings and slaughter against you? You know? I mean, it's a good thing if they didn't have Facebook, man. Saul would have been all over, right? <laughs> okay. You all know that. You know, people, I, I mean, it's, okay. Uh, breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, he went to the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus. He said he wanted bench warrants to go out and round up these, this, he calls them uh, people of this way. They, they didn't use the term Christian and that hadn't been, that hadn't been coined yet. They, they didn't see them as a separate thing from Judaism. They just saw them as, as renegade Jews, mavericks, troublemakers, rebels, revolutionaries. 
So Saul, figuring he's doing God a favor, I mean, he's on fire, he, he loves the Lord. If you go back and you read in like Philippians, he says, I used to be a Jew, I was a Hebrew of the Hebrews, I mean, I, I tore the place up, I, I believed in the law, I tried everything I could to, to follow the law, I was circumcised, I was a Hebrew. He, he bragged about, he used to brag about his Jewishness. So when he went out looking for, to round up these, this, the people of the way called Christians, now we call them Christians, he wanted to arrest them and throw them in jail. Maybe even put them to death. Stone them to death. Because he was a good Jew. Because he was a good Pharisee. Because he, he wanted to defend God against this renegade bunch. And he was sincere. So it says that he desired of the high priest many letters in verse 2 to Damascus, to the synagogues. Damascus is still there. It's, it's okay. This is history. This isn't just a fairy tale. That if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound into Jerusalem. So I want to round them up and throw them all in jail. There's some folks that like to do that to us right now. You know that? Are you aware of that? This right now, see, we ought to be praying because you know what's going on in the Supreme Court right now? You know they're making decisions. The decisions they make are going to have profound effect on the body of Christ. I hate to be a bearer of bad tidings. But you might as well arm yourself. If they, if they choose the wrong way, it's going to stir things up. <laughs> they, they, there's folks that want to make us illegal. Matter of fact, one of the candidates for the President of the United States coming up says, we need to change the way people do religion. Do you hear her say it? You can read it. Go Google it. She wants to wipe out what we what she calls our religion because it doesn't fit the way she thinks things ought to be. They want to try to tell you how you can worship what you can say and can't say. They're working on it. I didn't mean to go there, but you might as well listen. You might as well arm yourself with that idea. Somebody says, "Man, this is a bummer." Well, yeah, but, but it's it's happening. We could pretend like everything is just rosy in the world. It's not. So, so, you know, you ought to, you ought to, so there's going to come a time where there's going to be Saul's. And you know what? There are going to be folks with, with religious credentials that are coming, you're going to come and try to shut you up. I didn't, I didn't mean to go there, but, but I might as well. You know, I'm half ain't listening to me anyhow. That's all right. Somebody is. Okay. All right. Verse three. I hope you all listen to me. I, okay. As he journeyed, okay, now here's Saul. He got bench warrants. He's got, he's got, he's got the handcuffs, man. He's got, he's got everything with him. He's looking for this bunch. He wants to round them up. And he's on his way to Damascus because he heard there was a bunch up there. And suddenly, there shined around about him a light from heaven. It wasn't a strobe light. It wasn't, they didn't have that back then. It was a light from heaven. Almost like, if you remember in the Old Testament, when, when they were coming through the wilderness, the Shekinah glory of God. You know what? Light. It wasn't just like a flashlight. It wasn't a little light. But light from, if you get a light from heaven, there's going to be a light. When Jesus was on the Mount of Transfigurations, and He was, in, he was in, uh, covered with the light of God's glory, man. They couldn't even look at Him. A light shined round right about him from heaven. And he did the only thing he knew to do. He fell to the earth. I don't know if he was riding a horse. I don't know if he was riding a camel. I don't know if he was walking. But I know one thing. When he saw this light, he ended up on the ground. And he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? 
Saul, why are you doing this? Listen, this Saul, he studied under the, the greatest rabbi that ever lived. His name was Gamaliel. He knew the word inside and out. The Old Testament, New Testament had been written yet. He knew all what the word said about who Messiah ought to be. Everything he saw, Jesus did not deny he was a Messiah. Stephen, when Stephen was put to death, he looked up and he says, I see the, uh, the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And that really threw him, that really threw him off. I mean, he heard all this stuff. He knew who God is. He understood what God's word said. And when this light appeared and said, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He realized he was talking to somebody that wasn't human. He was talking to somebody way beyond. He recognized the voice and recognized the light as God, as the glory of God. And he said, why are you persecuting me? And Saul said to him, who are you Lord, just you remember. You remember when Jacob was wrestling with the angel. What did he say? Who are you? At that time, the angel said, "You know who I am." The answer here must have been very, very troubling to to Saul, because the answer he says, "I am Jesus." You know that Jesus that you said crucify him. You know that Jesus has been a thorn in your side for the last three and a half years. You know that Jesus had started this thing that you call the way? That Jesus that did all these miracles and, and proved who I was in front of you, yet you still deny me? That Jesus who right now you're trying to, to round up my followers and kill them? Well, I wonder what Saul was, was going on in Saul's mind. <laughs> he says, I am Jesus that you're persecuting. It's hard for you to kick against the pricks. Was well, he talking about sticks they used to use to make cows and oxen move, okay, to make them pull a cart? He said, imagine, it's almost like God was saying, Saul, I've been dealing with you for these last three and a half years and you've been ignoring me. What's it going to take to get you to make up your mind? See, I believe, again, Saul, like the other Pharisees, I believe he knew exactly who Jesus claimed to be. He wasn't, oh, who's this guy? And I believe God had been dealing with him. I wonder if when Saul was looking and seeing Stephen getting stoned to death, and Stephen is up there saying, Father, forgive him, they don't know what they're doing. Or when he saw Jesus hanging on that cross and he said, Father, forgive him, they don't know what they're doing. I wonder if something was stirring in his heart. I wonder if you ever hear God's word. And something stirs in your heart and you want to put it to sleep because you know God's dealing with you. And God's calling you and God's pulling you away from what you are and what you're doing. And wants you to be someone else. And is willing to make you someone else if you let him. He says, I'm Jesus that you're persecuting. Aren't you tired of kicking against? Aren't you tired of resisting me? Paul, Saul. And he, in verse 6, trembling, he was trembling and astonished because he realized that everything that he had been doing up to this point, he thought he was doing God a favor by killing Christians. Now he's standing in front of this, this God that he, he denied, Jesus, he denied that he was God, yet Jesus is saying, hey, I'm here. This is me. He was trembling and astonished, and he gave the only answer he knew how to give. He says, Lord, what do you want me to do? What can I do? After all I've done, he said in other places when he wrote letters, he said, I wasn't worthy of being saved because I persecuted the church. He's like, Jesus, what what do you want me to do? It's like Peter when he denied him. It's like uh, others who turned their back on God when they finally experienced God's mercy and His grace. And they say, well, why don't we, you know, what, what do you want me to do, Lord? They said when Peter preached that message on the day of Pentecost, the people said, what do we have to do to be saved? And Jesus gave him just like we said, whenever, whenever we have an encounter like this with God, He always calls us to go somewhere. Usually some place we don't want to go. <laughs> and He calls us to do something, usually something that we're like the least likely to do. To take a drug addict and make him a preacher. He'll take a bigot and make him a lover of all people. 
He'll give you a new name, just like he did with Jacob. He'll take a liar and a trickster, a con man, and make him a prince of God. Right now, he's taking this person that hated Christ, and he's going to make him the author of two-thirds of the New Testament. Now, listen. He says, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told you what you must do. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless. They heard a voice, or they heard the sound like thunder. They didn't understand the words. It says later, But they didn't see any man, but they saw the light, and they heard the noise. And saw a rose from the earth, and he opened up his eyes, but he couldn't see anything. God had blinded him. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. This man who was powerful, mighty, uh, knew God's word, had bench warrants in his hands to go make arrest. Now he couldn't even see where he was going. You know, sometimes God got to blind us before he can give us some vision. We need to look. We, we need to stop looking at ourselves or who we were so we can open our eyes and see who, see who he wants us to be. He was three days without sight and he did neither eat or drink, man. He, he was serious. He was fasting and praying. He was like, wow. Because he had an encounter with God. Listen to what it said. And there was a certain disciple of Damascus whose name was Ananias. And to him the Lord in a vision uh, said in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the street which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas, not Judas Iscariot. Acquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus, for before he's praying. And he has seen a vision uh, of a man named Ananias is coming in and putting him, his hand on him that he might receive his sight. So God is giving Saul this vision of what's supposed to happen. And Ananias says, Lord, are you, he, has, he has a warrant out for my arrest. He's come, he wants to knock on my door. You know, with a boom, boom, boom. He wants to take me back to Jerusalem and throw me in jail. Him? It says, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on your name. And then I says, Lord, he wants to arrest me. But the Lord said unto him, listen, here we go. Go your way, for he is a chosen vessel. When did God choose Saul? Did he choose him at the cross? Did you, he chose Saul before the beginning of the foundations of the earth. He chose the one who was most zealous, most filled with hatred for Christ. He chose the one that if, if I were to pick one, Saul would not have been. Just like he chose King David, the least of all the sons of Jesse. Nobody thought of him. Let's me know he can choose one of you. You might think God can never use me. I don't even like this stuff. I, God can't choose me. I'll tell you what, God can choose anybody. Matter of fact, he has already chosen. If, if you're chosen, you've already been chosen to, to, be, to be used by God. I'm not talking about salvation. I'm talking about to be used by God. Here's what he says. He is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles. What Saul before the Gentiles? He was a Pharisee. He hated Gentiles. He don't have nothing to do with non-Jews. He considered himself unclean. Saul going to the Gentiles? He'll bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. Saul... From the point of his salvation, he went into the wilderness for a while. He kind of like chilled out for about 14 years. But then when God called him and, and they laid his hands on him uh, in the church at Antioch, they sent him out and he and uh, uh, Barnabas and then him and Silas, they went out into all of Europe and they planted churches and they preached God's word. And he actually had a chance to preach before Nero. He had a chance to witness to Nero. Of course, they gave him an all-expense-paid trip on a ship, on a prison ship, from <laughs> Israel to, to Rome. Then he ended up getting shipwrecked and uh, cast on an island and bit by a snake and everything else. But the thing is, 
God called him. He says, listen, I want, I want you to go before the leader of the most powerful nation in the world. Like somebody said, well, listen, man, I got, I got your ticket to go and see Barack Obama. If we would get before Barack Obama, what would we say? Or any president, any president. I'm not, not just him. If they, if they stick us in front of the Supreme Court, what would we say? When, when Saul, after his name was changed to Paul, he appeared before King Agrippa, and he appeared before another proconsul named Festus, and he appeared before all these powerful leaders of the Roman Empire. And you know what? He did, he did not, he didn't defend himself. He just said, Man, just Jesus. He said, he talked about Christ and him crucified. As a matter of fact, Agrippa, one of them, he, he said, he said, he said, Paul, you almost, you almost got me saved. <laughs> you read that later on in the book of Acts. You almost persuaded me to be a Christian. Too bad. Almost doesn't make it. Okay. Anyway, let's read. Here's, 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 here's the big verse. This is, this is it. This is where we, this is what, this is what God is, this is what Jesus is saying to Ananias. I want you to go to this guy named Saul. He's a chosen vessel. He's going to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel, for I will show him. I'm showing him a few things right now. How great things he must, what? Suffer for my name's sake. I believe God is showing us, not just in this body of believers, but I think He's trying, He's trying to show the church by things that are happening in other parts of the world, horrible things are happening in Christians. He's, he's trying to show us what's coming to our shores that's here. That the persecution that's going to be coming against the body of Christ. And he's calling us, he's saying, listen, if you're mine and you have my Holy Spirit, I'm going to give you, I'm going to make you go in front of leaders and kings and, and unbelievers, and I'm going to give you the words to say, I want you to be prepared. He wants us to be prepared. He wants us to be filled with the Holy Spirit. He wants us to know that we're going to be called to go forth. And he hasn't quite shown me everything I'm going to suffer. I thank God that 24 years ago, whenever God, I thought God called me into ministry, and I'm glad that he did not give me a video presentation of the way things are going to be for the next 24 years. Because if he had, I'd still be in Allegheny Ludham Steel Corporation, probably making a whole lot more money I'm making right now. I'd be running that new mill. <laughs> yeah, man, I'd be, I had the seniority, man. I'd get me a good old class 25 job, whatever. And I, okay, he, did, he didn't show me, but he was telling Paul all the things. I wonder if he showed Paul being shipwrecked and beaten, uh, bitten by a snake. I wonder if he showed Paul the times he would be stoned and left for dead. I wonder if he was going to show Paul the times he'd be beaten with whips and, and, and thrown overboard and everything else. I wonder if he, if he showed him every little detail of what was going to go on. Whatever it was, Paul was ready to rumble. He was ready to go. He said... I sh I'm, I'm going to show him how great things he must suffer for my namesake. And Ananias went his way and entered into the house and putting his hands on him said, Brother Saul. <laughs> Man, he wasn't going to say that before. You know, we'd be thankful when somebody calls us a brother, sister in the Lord. It's all right. He said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto you in the way as you came, has sent me that you might receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. God fill us with the Holy Ghost. Because I'll tell you what Paul went through. He had to get filled, overflowing with the Holy Ghost. And immediately... There fell from his eyes that it had been scales, and he received sight forthwith, and he arose and was baptized. And when he had received meat and was strengthened, then was Saul certain days with the disciples which were at Damascus. And it goes on, and it talks about the history of Saul. He was at Damascus for a while. It says here that straight away he preached Christ, and then he went to the, to the synagogues, the places where he used to go there and be a Jew, and he started preaching Christ, that he is the Son of God. But all that heard him and, well, were amazed, in verse 21, they said, Is not he th him which destroyed them which called on his name in Jerusalem, and came here for that intent that he might... What happened to him? He came here to round up Christians and throw them in jail. Now he's preaching Jesus. Wow. It says that eventually Saul had to leave Damascus because they wanted to kill him. The Jews wanted to kill him. 
If you read the story, he went off into the desert for a while, then he went back to his hometown of Tarsus for a number of years. He didn't just jump into ministry, but he prepared himself. And when God called him, he was at the church at Antioch, and God called him, and they laid hands on him, and they sent him forth. And he became the apostle to the Gentiles. He went into Europe and planted churches all through Asia Minor and through Greece and, and so forth. He ended up going to Rome and witnessing. And every, every place he went, the Jews wanted to kill him. He actually went back to Jerusalem one time, and they talked him into going into the temple. And when, and when, the, when his old buddies from the Sanhedrin saw him there, oh, man, all, you, you think Baltimore was something. Everything was, was, got tore up there in Jerusalem. They got him, and they were actually literally pulling on him. One wanted to kill him, and the Romans had to come in and break things up. And it's in the book, Acts, you can read about it. But he was called, man, he had an encounter with Jesus, and he was called to be the exact 180 degree opposite of what he was before. He got a new name from Saul to Paul. And if you, if you look over there in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, we're not going to turn there, but if you look over there, you know what he said? He, he said over there, he says, I was allowed... Let's turn there. Why don't we read it? Because I'll probably forget some words. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Now, Paul, I didn't have it on the... On the uh, okay, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And check this out in verse 1. Paul says, listen, it's not expedient for me, doubtless to glory, I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. If you read this uh, 2 Corinthians, he's talking about, he's defending his ministry against people who were calling him a liar and everything, okay? And he says, i got visions and revelations. And everybody said, give me, a, oh Lord, give me a vision. How many people ever played that? Oh, I want a revelation. God, give me a revelation. Give me a vision. I want a prophecy. Oh, God, speak to me. Okay, listen to what he says. I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago, Paul saying, he's referring to himself, whether in the body I cannot tell or whether out of the body I cannot tell. God knows. Such a one caught up to the third heaven. Caught, Paul was caught up to the third heaven. Some people believe there's an incident in a place called Lystra where he was actually stoned and they left him for dead. And some people believe that that might have been a time when he had like an out-of-body experience and was called up into heaven, right? We don't know that for sure. But he says, I was called up into heaven. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out, I don't know. I can't tell, but God knows how that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words. He didn't write a book about it because he wasn't allowed. <laughs> oh, okay. F f folks were writing book about going to heaven. If Paul wasn't allowed to say nothing about it. <laughs> okay. All right. He says... These unspeakable words, which is not lawful for man to utter. Of such a one will I glory, yet of myself I will not glory, but in mine infirmities. And though I would desire to glory, I, I will not be a fool. All right, now look at verse 7. Look, look what happened. You want a revelation from God? You want to be used by God? I want a powerful ministry. I want to be prophetic. I want the gifts of the Spirit. I want to be able to be used by God. Okay. Paul was being used by God. Check this out. Lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations. He said, I have so many revelations. God decided that just to keep me from get, being real proud of myself. Because, you know, some folks get in ministry and they do a good job and they start thinking like you're something. He said, there was given unto me a what? Verse 7. A thorn in the flesh. Just like Jacob had a limp. Remember we talked about that? Paul had a thorn. You ever get a thorn? And when it moves around a little bit, it's like... He says, I was given a thorn in the flesh. The messenger of Satan sent to buffet me, not buffet me. <laughs> okay. A messenger... God allowed a messenger of Satan to be a thorn in his flesh. Why? So I would not be exalted... See, folks, when they get high, they want power, they want church, they want big churches, they want to be apostles, they want to be... Okay, are you willing to walk around with a limp or a thorn on your side? And he said, I, I, I prayed to, to the Lord three times. I said, take this thing out of me. Three times, God. Here's Paul, man, this is, this is no slouch here. We all know it. Some of you all know what it says. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for you. You know, it's getting to the point in time, in history, and it's like this in other parts of the world, but it's going to be really like this, that it's getting to the point 
where we're going to be all out of options. You know what I'm saying? We're not going to have the options we have now. But it's getting to the point where we're only going to have one option, and it's calling on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And He'll give us a thorn, and He'll give us a limp, He'll give us a new name, He'll give us a calling, He'll say, uh, you're no longer uh, a dope addict, you're a prince of God. You're no longer a liar, you're a prince of God. You're no longer a deceiver. Whatever, whatever it is, He'll give us a new name, but He's going to give us a limp, He's going to give us a thorn, and He's going to bless us, and He's going to cover us with His Holy Spirit, and He's going to cover us with His blood. And whatever they do in this world, it doesn't matter. Give me Jesus. I don't want nothing else. You take everything else. Take away the building, the whatever. I don't care. I just want Christ. That's all I want. I don't want to impress nobody. I don't want to entertain anybody. I really don't care if I ever preach another sermon in my life. I really don't. I just want Christ. I'll go get a job. I don't care. If I can't have Jesus, if I can't have that, if I, if I can't be what He wants me to be, you know. We prepare the Lord's table. You might, might want to uh, let, the, let the kids know. Okay, kind of go down.